Okay. Um, just to give a heads up to those who are here, we are recording this. Um, and so if you would like to keep your camera off, that is perfectly fine. Uh, my name's Kylie, I am an MS2 and um, also a registered dietitian. So um, lifestyle medicine has always been something that is, um, it's a deep passion of mine. And then uh, Gautam is exactly the same way. He is um, the brains behind all of the research that he's accumulated for this particular cardiology specific lecture. And um, he's put a lot of work into it and it is, I cannot wait to hear it. And he's just such a wealth of knowledge, but also is an MS to himself. So it's really nice to have that um, approachable bridge between someone who's really invested in this material as well as someone who's also totally going through what we're going through right now. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll give it away to you, Gautam. Cool. Yeah. So this is kind of an extension off of the first talk that was primarily just lifestyle medicine. Uh, this one is going to be focused on cardiology. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of uh, material that is covered on step one. So it's going to be a little bit of review from for the MS1s from your cardiology block. It's going to be a little bit of looking forward into what you'll be learning in ERM. And it's going to be great review for us MS2s who need to know this material like the back of our hand. Um, so let me share my screen. Oh, and while you're sharing, um, just to give everyone a heads up, you can put your questions in the chat, but we might hold questions unless they seem dire until the end so that we can make sure we get through as much material as possible in the hour. Cool. Um, and can you see my screen? Yes. Sweet. All right. Well, so let's get started. Um, so lifestyle medicine, cardiology, most effective prevention and cure for heartbreak. So disclosures as always. Um, and uh, acknowledgements. All of these people have been wonderful support mentors uh, and then also providing information for uh, this presentation. So thank you to all of these people uh, and all of the people who are not listed. All right, so this is what we're going to be going through today. Uh, first, we're going to review what we talked about last time very briefly. Uh, then we're going to talk about cardiovascular disease risk. The primary study that we're going to be taking a look at is the interheart study. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about a little bit of lipid transport and uh, the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease. Then we'll move on to standard therapies. Uh, we'll talk about statins. We'll talk about uh, percutaneous uh, interventions. Uh, and we'll talk about the COURAGE trial. Um, then we'll move on to the clinical guidelines set up by the uh, ACC and AHA. Uh, and then move on to the research in uh, the lifestyle therapies. So primarily the lifestyle heart trial uh, and then also the PDA studies. Finally, we're going to talk about communication and how to talk to your patients about this. So uh, firstly, uh, review. So lifestyle medicine. So this uh, series is on lifestyle medicine. What is lifestyle medicine? Uh, it's the evidence-based approach to prevent, treat, and reverse diseases by modifying lifestyle behaviors. And these behaviors are things like the food you eat, physical activity, stress, uh, relationships, sleep, uh, and substance use. And uh, this can all have a really big impact on your health. And we often think about these things as things that we should do, but don't always get around to. Uh, but it's important to keep this in the front of our mind, especially when we're talking about uh, health conditions, because all of these things play a role and uh, modifying these things can uh, uh, lead to great improvements. So review from the last presentation. Uh, the main thing that I wanted to get were the four main healthy lifestyle practices are one, a healthy diet, high in fruits and vegetables, two, uh, physical activity every week, at least three and a half hours or uh, 30 to 40 minutes a day, a healthy weight, uh, BMI of under 25 and uh, non-smoker status. So either abstaining uh, or stopping smoking. If you are able to do all four of these factors, you lower your risk of developing a chronic disease by almost 80%, yet only 3% of US adults follow all four. So that is what makes this a medical problem. Uh, we could be reducing our disease burden so greatly, yet only 3% of US adults are able to follow these things. Diet is the number one risk factor for both death and disability in the, in the US. A healthy diet can save uh, upwards of a trillion dollars and one fourth of all deaths globally. We spoke a little bit more about the food system uh, and how it is responsible for almost a third of greenhouse gases. When you reduce uh, your red meat consumption, that is when you have the greatest reduction uh, in your greenhouse uh, gas footprint. So reducing uh, or eliminating red meat consumption is the best thing you can do, not only for your own health, but also for the health of the environment. 
pretty much the entire U.S. under consumes fruits, uh, vegetables, and whole grains. This is partially a supply problem, but also partially uh, a problem with our government subsidies. And what we do subsidize is things like corn, uh, which is then put into processed foods uh, and things that are generally unhealthy and inexpensive. So this will uh, disproportionately affect people uh, with less financial means. And finally, the action that you can take is to talk to every single patient you see uh, about changing their diet, changing their lifestyle. Uh, because once you have that con uh, conversation with them, then you can see what is uh, the stumbling block for them or what obstacles do they have to achieving these goals. Because as we mentioned before, uh, the changes that they make in terms of lifestyle can have uh, incredible impacts on their health. All right, so into cardiology. So uh, on the CDC website, we see that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the US. Uh, amounting to almost 900,000 deaths annually. So just let that sink in for a second. Cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, 900,000 deaths annually. This amounts to $214 billion in healthcare costs. This is, th th these, are some, these are some big numbers, especially when you're talking about on the order of billions of dollars. This is, uh, our, our national defense spending is on the order of $600 billion. And so you can imagine how much we're spending on this uh, possibly preventable disease. And if you remember from uh, the last presentation, uh, when we looked at this paper on the state of US health, we saw that dietary risks are the number one risk factor uh, for both death and disability in the US. More importantly, I've highlighted here cardiovascular disease and the input from all of these risk factors such as dietary risk, tobacco use, uh, hypertension, etc. And you can see uh, that cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, can be accounted for by many of these things that we consider uh, modifiable, such as low physical activity, uh, hypercholesterolemia, et cetera. So the first study we're going to be looking at is the interheart study. So the interheart study is basically trying to find out what are the main risk factors for acute myocardial infarction, which I'll be shortening to uh, acute MI or AMI. So this is a case control study of 52 countries with 15,000 cases and almost 15,000 controls. So this is an extremely powerful study and they were trying to see the strength of association between risk factors and uh, acute MI. So I said it's a case control study. And so just as a quick review or looking forward for the uh, first years, you guys will be learning about this in your epidemiology block. There are three types of observational studies, cohort studies, case control studies, and cross-sectional studies. So uh, this is a case control study and describing a case control study, essentially it is a retrospective study. You're first going to identify your cases and your controls. So these are people who are affected by your, by your dependent variable and people who are not affected by your dependent variable. So in our case, this we have 15,000 cases with uh, acute MI and we have uh, almost 15,000 cases without acute MI. And then we will retrospectively look and see what uh, were the exposures they had in terms of smoking, lipids, et cetera. The outcome measure for a case control study is an odds ratio. The other one was a cohort study. I'm not gonna talk about cross-sectional studies, which is basically like a snapshot in time, but cohort studies are similar, but they are kind of flipped around. So it is a prospective analysis where first you look at the exposures. So for example, people who are exposed to uh, smoking, uh, high lipids, et cetera, and then you see how their outcome changes. So then you see, will they develop uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction? You can do this retrospectively as a simulation and the out outcome measure is relative risk. So case control study, outcome measure is odds ratio. Cohort study, outcome measure is relative risk. And uh, this uh, diagram by Dr. Shaneyfeldt at UAB, uh, kind of sums it up pretty nicely. So the case control is at the present time, you define who your cases are. So who has AMI and your controls, who does not have it? And then you look at their respective exposures. So for example, if we had hundred people with AMI and hundred people without, and you look at their smoking status, 50 of those hundred people uh, were smokers, whereas only five of the hundred people who did not develop AMI were smokers. Then you can start to see a relationship there. Looking at the same data from uh, the aspect of a cohort study, we can see the exposure. So people who were smokers versus not smokers, and then who developed AMI. So you can see that uh, nearly all, so over 90% of the people who were smokers developed uh, AMI. And this is all, uh, th these aren't real numbers, they're, they're just made up. Um, but here for the people who were not exposed, 
uh, less than half of them uh, developed AMI. So some longitudinal cardiovascular studies that I just kind of want these words to be bouncing around in your head so that when you uh, do hear them or you see them on a paper, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've heard about that before. These are some of the major studies, the Framingham uh, study, the cardiovascular health study, Cardia, Mesa, Sol, Masala. They always have some uh, very interesting acronym. Um, and all of these have uh, different numbers of, numbers of people, uh, They uh, people of different demographics, and they have different focuses in terms of what they're trying to figure out. These are all very large studies, and they have a lot of data. And in fact, if you're interested in analyzing the data from this study, uh, a lot of it will be available through PIs at our institution or other institutions if you're interested in doing uh, epidemiological research. Some other pretty prominent ones are the Physician's Health Study and the Nurse's Health Study. And we will be talking about in this presentation some of the data from the Nurse's Health Study. Uh, another one is the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, which I haven't mentioned here. Uh, but again, you can look at so many different exposures and these are all perspectives. So for example, uh, contraception or smoking status and, and then what the outcome was uh, down the line like cancer and heart disease. Okay, so going back to the interheart study. So this was a case control study. So uh, they defined their cases, the people with AMI and the controls, the people without, and then they went retrospectively to see uh, who developed um, or what, what their exposure statuses were. And these were all the different things that they looked at in terms of lifestyle, uh, hypertension, psychosocial uh, components, et cetera. And they also took some uh, non-fasting blood samples of uh, total cholesterol, HDL, ApoB, and ApoA1, which I'll explain in a second. So this is uh, a lot of data, but let's uh, just look at a small part of it. So on the left here, you can see the uh, risk factors that they analyzed in terms of smoking, hypertension, exercise, et cetera, ApoB to ApoA1 ratio. And these were the odds ratios um, that were adjusted. And so I want to draw your attention right here. Pretty much all of the risk factors are increasing the odds of developing AMI aside from increased vegetable and fruit intake and exercise. And you can see there's a reduction in the odds of developing AMI for both of these. Uh, alcohol intake, there's also a reduction, but the significance is a little lower. And then there's also uh, uh, some ideas about whether this could be because of a sick quitter hypothesis or um, a J curve or something like that. So that's why I'm not uh, talking about that right now. But yeah, so vegetable and fruit and exercise can reduce your risk of developing AMI as shown in the uh, interheart study. But I, I'm talking about uh, things like ApoB, ApoA1. And so just to really clarify what that is, I'm going to dive into the uh, biochemistry of it for a second. And this is going to be reviewed for uh, the uh, second years. And hopefully, you'll learn something new for the first years. Um, and this, this is all pretty much directly from your first year lectures in metabolism in the ERM block. So uh, at least it'll be a nice sneak peek. So this is our cholesterol molecule. And this is the organic chemistry mechanism for you to get to vitamin D. And if you're interested, you can do the electron pushing. So cholesterol is something that all animals produce. So we actually produce it by ourselves. We, we make as much as we need. Uh, plasma membranes in all of the cells in our body. Unlike other fats, it's not a cellular fuel though. Uh, it's stored as a cholesterol ester and that uh, is catalyzed by uh, these two enzymes. So uh, acetyl, uh, sorry, uh, acyl-CoA cholesterol acyl transferase, ACAT, and then LCAT. Um, and these are stored within our uh, cytosol. So you should know ACAT, you should know LCAT, and you should also know MCAT. Uh, the cholesterols are transported in lipoproteins and excreted in the feces. So I said that they uh, can be synthesized, synthesized endogenously. And so just to drive that point home, our cholesterol sources are the cholesterol we make by ourselves in our liver, and then also the cholesterol that we consume if we consume animal products. So firstly, we're going to look at the cholesterol we consume. And so this is a figure from uh, first aid. Uh, so if you want to follow along in first aid or take notes in first aid, or if you just want to uh, sit back, relax, and think about first aid later, <laughs> you can do that too. Um, OK, so here we have. Uh, what we're consuming. Uh, so this is dietary fat and cholesterol. And so this uh, will be uh, broken down by pancreatic lipase, et cetera, uh, down into free fatty acids. In your enterocyte, it will get repackaged, sent through your lymphatics and into your vasculature. And this process right here is basically how the um, triglycerides and your cholesterol gets distributed among your organs. So that's essentially what's going on here. And there are a couple different pathways here that I'll be explaining in a second. So just to dive in a little deeper. After these broken down fatty acid components and cholesterol uh, gets into the enterocyte, it gets packaged into a chylomicron. 
So this first half right here uh, of this process is basically chylomicrons being depleted, becoming a chylomicron remnant, and then being absorbed into your liver, into your hepatocytes. The second half of this is secretion of VLDLs, uh, depletion of your VLDL into IDL, and then uh, depletion to LDL, and then absorption into peripheral cells or back into your liver. So those are the two things here. And this is all part of the distribution pathway. So this is how uh, your triglycerides and cholesterol gets distributed uh, in your body. So it can be from the uh, chylomicrons after the food you intake, and then it can also be what your uh, liver puts out. One thing to note here is the apolipoprotein. So apolipoproteins are uh, proteins that are found uh, on these lipoproteins uh, that right here are structural. So we have ApoB48, uh, and then we have an ApoB100 here. So for the lipoproteins that are coming from our enterocytes, they're going to be given ApoB48 until we reach the liver. And then for the lipoproteins that exit from our hepatocytes, they're going to be given ApoB100. So this is the distribution pathway. We also have a scavenging pathway, which is a kind of a little bit reverse, and that's basically HDL. So HDL gets secreted by our liver. Uh, it can go to peripheral cells uh, like your macrophages, uh, and it can take some of that cholesterol. So macrophages can give some of the cholesterol uh, to the um, HDL. The HDL can convert it to cholesterol ester and then bring it back to the hepatocyte. So that's why we kind of think of good cholesterol as HDL and bad cholesterol as LDL, because uh, LDL is the endpoint of this delivery pathway where cholesterol is being delivered to your peripheral tissues. And HDL is the reverse pathway where cholesterol is being taken from the peripheral tissues and brought back to uh, your hepatocytes. So to talk about the apolipoproteins uh, just a little bit more. So ApoB48 is found on your chylomicrons and ApoB100 is found on your VLDL, IDL, uh, LDL pathway here. ApoE and ApoC2 are found on your HDL and it is then transferred to chylomicrons so that chylomicrons can be uh, depleted by lipoprotein lipase, which is found in the uh, endothelium. VLDL is also given the ApoC2 and ApoE by HDL so that it can also be depleted by the lipoprotein lipase right there. Finally, uh, we have uh, ApoA1, and ApoA1 is just uh, apolipoprotein that sits on uh, HDL. It activates LCAT, and this is what allows uh, HDL to, after it gets the cholesterol from the macrophage and it wants to put the cholesterol ester into storage in our hepatocytes, LCAT is what lets the cholesterol get um, uh, catalyzed into um, the cholesterol ester. So when we're looking at uh, this simplified diagram, we can see the input uh, in our intestinal lumen of cholesterol, free fatty acids, etc., becomes chylomicrons, enters our bloodstream. This chylomicron can be recycled and uh, exported as VLDL, which then gets uh, depleted down to LDL and can be reuptaken, or it can go out into a peripheral tissue. Uh, HDL can also be uh, output by your liver, and it can scavenge up cholesterol from peripheral tissues and then return to the liver. And so this is all ways that we can get cholesterol in the liver. So that was all the uh, exogenous pathway. The end endogenous pathway of cholesterol creation uh, has to do with the infamous acetyl-CoA. Uh, its downstream agent AMG, uh, HMG-CoA uh, will be metabolized by HMG-CoA reductase to eventually make cholesterol. So that is how we ourselves can make cholesterol. And statins block HMG-CoA reductase. So they are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. So if you're inputting a lot of cholesterol uh, through your diet, you can actually reduce your total amount of uh, cholesterol by taking a statin and reducing how much you make. Of course, the other way of doing it is not to have as much cholesterol so that your body can maintain an equilibrium. As we mentioned before, uh, your body makes as much cholesterol as it needs. <clears throat> so how does this have to do, what, what does this have to do with uh, cardiovascular disease? So normally I said uh, we have macrophages as our peripheral cells that are able to uh, uptake uh, LDL and it has that cholesterol and then it can give that cholesterol to HDL to return to the hepatocytes. But macrophages actually have uh, a normal function, and that's to phagocytose apoptotic cells. And apoptotic cells have cholesterol in their membrane, and that's where it's primarily getting its cholesterol from. So now it has two inputs of cholesterol from the cells that it's apoptosing, uh, or sorry, phagocytosing, the apoptotic cells, and then also from the LDL that's circulating. So if your circulating LDL is high and it's giving the macrophages a lot of LDL, it's not going to be able to uh, push all that, uh, all that cholesterol off onto the HDL 
Um, so what's going to happen is you're going to have the cholesterol buildup in your macrophages, and that is what creates a foam cell. And when this happens in your endothelium, it can create a fatty streak, which over time will form a fibrous plaque. Again, uh, this uh, is in first aid. <clears throat> so now you have this giant uh, fibrous plaque in your uh, in, in some sort of vasculature. What can happen is this can rupture and then float throughout your body as a thrombosis. So. Uh, if it goes into one of your coronary arteries, it can cause a uh, myocardial infarction. If it goes into your brain, it can cause a stroke. And then also you're going to have some heterogeneity of uh, the wall here because of this change in uh, morphology, and that can cause an aneurysm. Uh, so these are all the reasons why we call LDL cholesterol bad cholesterol, because this oxidized LDL that's sitting around uh, in your endothelium and the LDL that gets absorbed by your macrophages as well, um, becomes uh, these foam cells, becomes fatty streaks, et cetera. And this leads to atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. All right, so big tangent, but hopefully that was some good information for you guys in terms of sneak peek for metabolism or for uh, your board exam. So coming back to this. So yes, we said that uh, fruits and vegetables daily are going to reduce your odds of getting a myocardial infarction. But now it probably makes a little more sense why your ApoB to ApoA1 ratio also plays a role in uh, the odds of myocardial infarction. So ApoB, remember, is the apolipoprotein in the distribution pathway. You have ApoB48 in your chylomicrons, uh, and then ApoB100 in your VLDL, IDL, uh, LDL pathway. ApoA1 is only on your HDL. So your ApoB to ApoA1 ratio is going to tell you your distribution pathway to your scavenger pathway ratio. As you increase this ratio, your odds of uh, getting a myocardial infarction increase which makes sense. You're distributing more cholesterol than you're scavenging up. Here's more uh, data from the uh, interheart study. Uh, this is smoking, uh, and this is ApoB to ApoA1 ratio. Uh, here we have a couple different factors. So smoking, diabetes, and hypertension, you can see the odds ratio is two to four. Uh, so your odds of developing it are more than baseline. ApoB to ApoA1 ratio is also here. And then they've also done some fun sums here. Uh, all four of these, one plus two plus three, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see how your odds ratio starts skyrocketing as you add on more of these risk factors. And then now we have the opposite where uh, our odds are decreasing. So uh, refraining from smoking, uh, your odds of developing uh, myocardial infarction are looks like 0.3 or 0.4. Uh, fruit and vegetable intake, exercise, and then alcohol, as I mentioned, does not have as strong of uh, a connection. But fruit and vegetable and exercise especially, when you start summating, your odds uh, go down drastically of developing AMI. So at the end of the day, what are the findings from the interheart study? <clears throat> we found that, uh, <laughs> when I say we found that, we found it while reading it, they're the ones who actually found it. Uh, these are the main uh, risk factors for uh, myocardial infarction. So smoking, elevated ApoB to ApoA1 ratio, hypertension, uh, diabetes, abdominal obesity, psychosocial factors, so this is like stress and depression. Uh, daily consumption of fruits and vegetables, regular physical activity, and alcohol intake. So daily consumption of fruits and vegetables and regular physical activity are the ones that reduce your odds, and the rest of these increase your odds with alcohol having uh, a weak association. And so this uh, collectively accounts for 90% of the population attributable risk. So population attributable risk is the proportion of cases uh, that, is, that uh, is attributable to these risk factors. So 90% of all cases can be attributed to these risk factors. If we look at the interstroke study, which a uh, similar study, except for stroke, uh, the risk factors for stroke instead of uh, for uh, myocardial infarction, we see pretty much the same list. Again, 90% PAR uh, with these um, risk factors. So very importantly, what they found through the interheart and interstroke studies is that targeted interventions that reduce blood pressure, smoking, promote physical activity, and a healthy diet could substantially reduce the burden of stroke. So there are a lot of other papers uh, that are done on the interheart study. Uh, if you want, if you're interested, like specifically in the psychosocial risk factors or specifically in lipids or specifically in dietary patterns, please feel free to go and uh, read these papers because they're very interesting and they go much more in depth into that uh, one aspect of it. Okay, so quick summary here. Uh, we know that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death and dietary risks uh, are the number one for death and disability, uh, a large part of which uh, is attributable to cardiovascular disease. Our body endogenously produces sufficient cholesterol, but we're able to intake it exogenously as well. 
Interheart and Interstroke showed uh, about the same risk factors for MI and stroke, uh, and the ones that reduce your odds uh, of developing uh, MI or stroke are fruit and vegetable intake and physical activity. ApoB is the lipoprotein on cholesterol distribution pathways, so that's the chylomicron, chylomicron remnant, VLDL, uh, IDL, LDL, uh, and ApoA is on your HDL. So that's why the ApoB to ApoA ratio uh, is important. All right, uh, are there questions? Yes, I can share the slides. Um, yeah, cool. All right, uh, continuing on. Sorry, this is a really long presentation. I know I'm like going through it very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of very, very good information that I want to at least touch your brain. So talking about standard therapies. So we saw this picture before, but I had uh, occluded a lot of the parts of the image. Now you can see that there are a lot of pharmacological targets uh, in terms of the lipid pathway. So initially we had just talked about statins, but you can also have PCSK9 inhibitors. So PCSK9 are going to be affecting uh, your LDL receptor turnover. And so if you inhibit them, you're going to have more LDL receptor available in the uh, liver. So LDL is going to be uptaken more. So you're going to have less circulating LDL. So that's why PCSK9 inhibitors work. You have things that you know reduce cholesterol absorption. You have things that reduce bile acid reabsorption because that's also a source of cholesterol. Um, all these, uh, all of these uh, druggable targets. But statins are the number one uh, in terms of lipid lowering agents. And they're recommended for any of these four groups. So if an individual has known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease without heart failure, and they're not receiving hemodialysis, they're put on a statin. Uh, LDL here, if this is your age, you have diabetes and your LDLs here, et cetera, et cetera. So statins are very widely prescribed. In fact, Statins are the number one prescription in the US uh, in 2018, and I'm guessing it's pretty similar now. And if we look at the rest of the list, there's something very interesting. A lot of these have to do with heart disease. Uh, you have lisinopril, which is an ACE inhibitor. You have uh, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. Uh, you have ARBs, and you have another statin down there. So a lot of these have to do with uh, either um, actually your ch changing your lipid metabolism, so like your atorvastatin and your simvastatin, or it can do with uh, uh, affecting your volume, affecting the renin angiotensin system, all things that have to do with your cardiovascular health. So many of the top 10 prescriptions in the US are all towards cardiovascular disease and associated diseases. So how effective are these actually? Uh, so this is a study published in JAMA. This is one published in The Lancet about the effectiveness of statins and the effectiveness of antihypertensives. So let's take a look at this really quick. Um, these are both meta-analytical. So they're looking at numerous studies, 25 studies for the statin study and 29 uh, for the antihypertensives, uh, accounting for almost 70,000 individuals in the statins and over 160,000 in the antihypertensives. So what do we see from this? The reduction in uh, CHD mortality or non-fatal myocardial infarction is the relative risk reduction was 0.75. So you have a 25% relative risk reduction by using stent, which is pretty decent. Uh, and then same you see over here with the ACE inhibitors, the CCBs, and the ARBs, uh, you're going to get about a 10 to 25% uh, relative risk reduction. So basically, uh, for all of these pharmacological therapies, whether it be statins or antihypertensives, the efficacy is about a 10 to 25% relative risk reduction of your chances of developing uh, whatever uh, acute myocardial infarction or uh, the other types of cardiovascular disease that it's meant to prevent. But if we remember from the last presentation, uh, we looked at the study of uh, over 23,000 participants, and we saw that you can have risk reductions that are on that same order of 10 to 30% by doing lifestyle things. And similarly here, so this is hazard ratio, so the endpoint would be a relative risk. Uh, you have statins and ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers, which are going to give you about the same risk reduction as uh, physical activity for three and a half hours per week or uh, diet index greater than the median. Um, and ARBs, uh, can compared to everything else, are actually not that effective with only a 10% relative risk reduction. And you look at something like not smoking and keeping a low BMI, your relative risk reduction is over 70%. So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about the efficacy of these drugs where uh, you can have lifestyle therapies that are much, much more effective. 
So let's move on from these pharmacological therapies. So let's say you get an occluded artery. What are you going to do about that? Well, the, the main therapy for that is to go in and open it up. That's what we want to do. And that's called a PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention. And so that can be ballooning and stenting. Uh, and it's usually uh, also incorporates an angiogram. Uh, and this was the COURAGE trial. So the COURAGE trial was huge in interventional cardiology, 50 centers throughout U.S. and Canada. Uh, this was the inclusion criteria, and they had uh, 958 PCIs conducted, and they compared it to 11, uh, 1,138 people on medical therapy. And so this includes things like aspirin, ACE inhibitors, R statins, et cetera, all the other things we've spoken about. So they're comparing the balloon and stent to medical therapy because obviously the uh, angioplasty procedures are much more invasive than the medical therapies. And so again, another picture from first aid, just to show you uh, the vasculature of the heart. Uh, the primary uh, vasculature that is going to get occluded, the first one is your left anterior descending right here, which provides uh, a lot of oxygen and nutrients to your left ventricle. So you can imagine uh, if you get an occlusion here, you're going to have a watershed effect that uh, results in ischemia of your left ventricle and uh, myocardial infarction, which means your heart's not going to be able to, pu to pump uh, at full capacity. After that, it's going to be your right coronary artery and then the circumflex of your uh, left coronary artery. Those are the most likely to get occluded. So those are the ones that we're going to want to go into and stent open if they get closed. So this is data from the COURAGE trial. Uh, and what they found was early revascularization, so these PCI procedures did not actually reduce the primary composite endpoint of death or non-fatal myocardial infarction, rate of stroke, or rate of acute coronary syndrome. So having that invasive procedure done, having the catheterization uh, and the angioplasty, the ballooning and stenting, was not actually that much better than the medication. In fact, uh, the data showed that at the end of five years, the percent of people free from angina was the same between the people who had the medical therapy and the PCI done. There was a little bit of a difference where the PCI people had a little bit more relief at the one year and three year follow-up, but at the end of five years, it was no longer statistically significant. So the results of this were kind of shocking to the interventional cardiology community where it's like, okay, well, we do these procedures so often, uh, 1.3 million coronary angioplasties done annually, uh, 448,000 coronary bypass operations totaling to more than $100 billion. We do these so often, yet we can treat these patients safely and effectively just with intensive medical therapy, reserving that revascularization for patients with persistent or progressive symptoms. So for patients with stable ischemic heart disease, stable, uh, stable ischemic heart disease, we could just be using the medication management as the PCI was not associated with a reduction in death in comparison. So, okay, we, we compared the PCIs to... Um, the medication, but how about to something like exercise training? And if you look at this, we start seeing this is a randomized control trial with 101 patients. We see that patients who had exercise training as opposed to stent angioplasty uh, actually performed better in terms of event-free survival. So they were actually able to last longer without having uh, an acute event. Not only that, but it was more cost-effective. And you can look at the costs in this study. Um, the exercise wasn't even that intense. It was 20 minutes per day. Uh, and once a week, they had a one hour group aerobic workout and they performed better than the people with the PCI. There are plenty more studies done on exercise-based rehab for, uh, for coronary heart disease. And you can see there's a relative, there's a odds ratio of 0.74. So reduction by almost 25, over 25% uh, in uh, terms of cardiac mortality. Additionally, you're getting reductions of your total cholesterol, your triglycerides, your systolic blood pressure. These are all beneficial side effects to doing that exercise. Not only is it going to be uh, as good for you or better than the PCI treatment, but it's also going to have all of these other effects. Uh, and then another study that also uh, was a uh, trial showing the exercise versus the PCI. And this one also had a low-fat diet incorporated. So to summarize that, we talked a little bit about statins. They're the number one prescribed uh, medication in the U.S. as of 2018, and uh, they are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, so they inhibit our own body from producing cholesterol. The efficacy of pharmacological therapies, only about 10 to 25 percent, and we remember that if you conduct all four of those lifestyle behaviors, it's a 78 percent reduction in your hazard. 
We looked at the COURAGE trial, uh, which showed that PCIs do not necessarily have better outcomes than medication when you have patients with stable ischemic heart disease. And exercise-based rehab may be more effective than PCI in these stable patients. So what do our clinical guidelines say? If we're saying, like, okay, these PCIs might not be the best, are the medications the best? Are lifestyle uh, options the best? So the ACC and AHA clinical guidelines are usually laid out like this, where you have a class of recommendation and a level of evidence. Class of recommendation is just telling you do the benefits outweigh the risks? Level of evidence tells you how much research we have on that. So A is the best, B means that we don't have any high quality registries on it, and then C means we have limited data or it's anecdotal uh, expert uh, evidence. So looking at the ACC AHA guidelines, actually ACC AHA AATS PCN AACAIN STS uh, guideline for the management of patients with uh, stable ischemic heart disease, the a uh, level of uh, recommendation is one for both revascularization in patients with type 2 diabetes with complex multivessel uh, coronary artery disease and cabbage being better than PCI in these patients. But the level of evidence is C. So this could be very little evidence or uh, this is the expert opinion and B, which is pretty decent. We have some research on it. If we look at the non-pharmacological interventions for hypertension, weight loss, heart healthy diet, and uh, increased physical activity. Totally safe and a lot of research on it. The benefits hugely outweigh the risk because there are basically no risks to doing these things. If we start looking at the management of blood cholesterol, again, we see uh, the benefits of taking a statin for intermediate risk adults outweigh the risks, but there are risks, unlike weight loss, uh, heart healthy diet, and increased physical activity. And you can see down here, up to one in five patients who take statins can develop myalgias, uh, some of them can develop new onset type 2 diabetes, and this is usually in patients who are already obese, have a high fasting blood glucose, metabolic syndrome, or an A1C above 6%. And you can imagine that patients who are going on, uh, on lipid-lowering lipid lowering medications may already have some of these comorbidities. Uh, so that's definitely something to consider. There are other, other uh, rare side effects as well, such as rhabdomyolysis, uh, hepatic failure, meta and memory and cognitive effects. But... Uh, as we go into less ideal populations, such as children or people over 75, you can see that the evidence gets worse. The dietary pattern that's recommended by the ACC and AHA in their clinical guidelines is high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. That's the main thing. Healthy protein sources, uh, and then non-tropical vegetable oils. Limit, and this could be reduce or eliminate, sweets, sugar-sweetened beverages, and red meats. Their aerobic exercise recommendation is 40 minutes, uh, three to four times per week. And so as you can see, pretty generally, the recommendations given by everyone are roughly the same. Lots of fruits and vegetables, reduce or eliminate red meat, and aerobic exercise 30 minutes every day, three and a half uh, hours per week if you can. So this is their top 10 from their clinical guidelines that they post with their paper. The first thing is the most important thing. The most important way to prevent atherosclerotic vascular disease, heart failure, and atrial fibrillation is to promote a healthy lifestyle throughout life. Enough said, you know. Um, we spoke about healthy diet already. We spoke about physical activity, uh, especially for patients with type 2 diabetes. Lifestyle changes are vital. Uh, tobacco use. Uh, aspirin should be used infrequently uh, in the routine prevention of ASCVD because of lack of net benefit. We spoke about statin therapies and then non-pharmacological interventions are recommended for all patients uh, with uh, hypertension. So to summarize that really quickly, the clinical guidelines stress a healthy diet and physical activity. There are huge benefits to this and pretty much no risk. Statins also have considerable benefits for patients who, who need to use them, but they do present with some risks. And as I said, the first line of that top 10 uh, from the ACC AHA guidelines is the most important way to prevent atherosclerotic vascular disease is through a healthy lifestyle. So what are the lifestyle therapies? So going back way into 1951, I wanted to take a look at this paper. Uh, it's actually very interesting. It's from uh, World War II. What they saw is, during the late world, national dietaries were greatly changed in most European countries occupied by the enemy. So their food was getting stolen or they were not having enough supply. What they saw is their death due to circulatory diseases dropped dramatically. And this precipitous drop could be because of a decrease in food containing fat and cholesterol. And so they analyzed this a little more and they saw that there was a decline in consumption of meat, meat products, whole cream, whole milk, cream, margarine, other fats, et cetera, et cetera. And just with that reduction in uh, fatty foods, you can also see a reduction in mortality from circulatory diseases. 
Uh, on the other hand, there was a rise in consumption of things like fish, skim milk, cereals, potatoes, and vegetables, which are arguably healthier. It's also a caloric reduction. So they, they didn't say that they were going to attribute this purely to the dietary change, but best know that there might be a dietary component to this. So fast forward over 50 years, and now we have dietary ways to reverse cardiovascular disease. So this was uh, done by Dr. Esselstein. You see here, this was uh, 198 patients who just had plant-based nutrition counseling. They weren't given food. Um, within three weeks, you see improved perfusion of myocardium uh, just with that plant-based nutritional in intervention, and that's just counseling. And 32 months of plant-based nutrition, this is essentially what a PCI would do, where you have reversal of coronary artery disease, you have major occlusion of this artery, and it's basically come back to full form here. And that's incredible. This is without any medications. And there are many potential mechanisms for this. Uh, some in incorporate uh, your LDL, HDL uh, equilibrium. Some are more to do with um, your inflammatory markers. But at the end of the day, this plant-based nutrition counseling was able to restore perfusion to the heart and open up previously occluded coronary arteries. That's incredible. So in uh, from the 90s to the early 2000s, uh, Dr. Dean Ornish did a bunch of trials in lifestyle medicine, uh, first being the lifestyle heart trial. So we're going to talk about these very briefly. The um, lifestyle heart trial was a randomized control trial uh, in which they found that coronary artery stenosis could have regressed in the experimental group just from this counseling. Their counseling was have a low-fat vegetarian diet, smoking cessation, stress management training, and moderate exercise just from that counseling. So that's just from teaching, teaching their patients. That's something you guys can do as well. We can all be teaching our patients about these things as we go into our rotations or as we go into ACA, if we go shadowing. And aside from this, there were significant reductions in weight, ApoB, LDL, and total cholesterol. And we spoke about how the pathophysiology of ApoB, LDL, and total cholesterol play into this. So the second study in that series, again, same exact uh, counseling, low-fat vegetarian diet, smoking cessation, stress management, and moderate exercise. Again, you can see on this graph, the treatment groups of the people who receive the counseling, largely uh, their, their stenosis goes down drastically compared to the control group who did not receive this counseling. And you can see the p-values down here. <clears throat> Further studies also done by uh, Dr. Ornish, uh, large 1,000 patient and 3,000 patient study. Again, you're having huge improvements in terms of angina, exercise capacity, uh, and all of these risk factors that we saw earlier in the inter-heart and interstroke studies could lead to AMI. So what are the specific factors in these diets that are helping us? So uh, this PURE study showed that fruit, vegetable, and legume intake could have an effect on cardiovascular disease. This is a huge study of over 130,000 people. And I'm not going to show you all the data. I know I'm running out of time here, but uh, just the fruits here, you can see there is a drop in your hazard ratio for all of these for major cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular mortality, et cetera, et cetera, just from having increasing fruits. So from less than three fruits per week to more than three per day. I don't expect everyone to be eating three fruits per day, but as you can see, the more you eat, the better it is for you. And these were the findings in terms of the fruit intake, legume intake, and raw vegetable intake, basically lower total mortality across the board. From the health professionals follow-up study, they saw a reduction in 62% of coronary events, or sorry, they, they saw that 62% of coronary events could have been prevented by adhering to those five healthy lifestyles. And it's uh, uh, the similar lifestyle practices that we've been talking about this whole time. Just by adopting two or more of these low-risk lifestyle factors reduces your risk of uh, coronary heart disease by 27%. And this is even valid in patients taking medication. So don't forget that. Just because they're taking medication does not mean they, can, uh, they shouldn't be exercising and having a good diet as well. In the nurses' health study, there's three studies here, and I've just put the conclusions here uh, if you're interested. But again, diet, exercise, abstinence from smoking, uh, replacing saturated and trans uh, unsaturated fats with monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. So this was uh, studied and shown in the presidential advisory back in 2017 from the American Heart Association that polyunsaturated fats are better than monounsaturated fats that are better than saturated fat. And in general, that's a, a good rule to go by. Your polyunsaturated fats are going to be things like canola oil, et cetera, et cetera. And we have the rest of uh, the sources here. As you can see here, the change in risk by having polyunsaturated fat substitute your uh, saturated fat substituted by polyunsaturated fat 
is much greater than monounsaturated fat and your risk goes the other way. Your risk increases if you replace your saturated fats with trans fats. And then the North Corellia project, we spoke about this last time, but this was a government and industry collaboration uh, to reduce the amount of saturated fat intake in Finland. And they were able to reduce serum cholesterol by 13% in men and 18% in women. Coronary heart disease death rates decreased across the board over 50%. Think about that. If we were able to reduce our annual death of uh, cardiovascular disease, that's we're talking about 900,000 right now, 400,000 lives could be saved every year if we were able to do something like this. That's incredible. That's like, I know I say this all the time, but when we say like, primo non necessaire, like I came to med school to help people, like that is helping so many people. Uh, and that's just an incredible impact that you can have. And this all starts very early. So we've spoken about the atherosclerotic uh, pathogenesis, but the uh, the actual genesis of uh, ather atherosclerotic plaques and stuff happens very early in life. And that's what these P-Day studies were looking at, the pathobiological determinants of atherosclerosis in youth. How they conducted this was uh, patients who died of external causes like car accidents, et cetera, they were, uh, did an autopsy and they looked at their hearts and they correlated them to the risk scores calculated from their traditional coronary heart risk factors, such as their, um, their uh, hypertension or their ApoB to ApoA1, et cetera. And what they found was uh, these are directly associated. So ha these risk factors are good markers of what's going on inside. And patients that had more risk factors uh, were likely to have more atherosclerotic lesions. So uh, atherosclerosis begins in youth. It's not just a disease of old people. And not only does it begin in youth, it can actually begin in the fetus. And this study showed that when mothers have uh, hypercholesterolemia or transient hypercholesterolemia, the fetal aortas do reflect that. And this could be because of the LDL oxidation and formation of the fatty streaks uh, during fetal development. And the order of this is uh, not totally certain where it's the LDL oxidation could actually precede the formation of the foam cells and the fatty streaks from the, uh, from the macrophages. But regardless, maternal hypercholesterolemia, so hypercholesterolemia of the mother, what the mom is eating can affect the baby before the baby's even born. Finally, we're going to talk about communication. So we've talked about a lot of different diets and how we can, uh, what the research is behind making ourselves healthier in terms of cardiovascular disease. But how do we talk to our patients about this? So this is from one of those PDA uh, review articles. We need to create a society in which youth enter adulthood with a low risk of CHD and maintain that low risk throughout life. So that's a cultural thing. That's a societal thing. And it's not just an individual person's choice. It's their circumstance. And it's their parents. It's what their parents were eating before that. Uh, and it's what they're fed in school. It's what they see on TV. It's so many different things. So. As physicians, the best thing we can do is to talk to every single patient about their lifestyle factors, to talk to them about their diet, talk to them, where do they get their groceries from? How often do they get to meal prep? Are they uh, dependent on someone else for their meals? Do they create meals for other people? Uh, and talk about what their obstacles are there. This was a study done in France, which was a cross analysis of dietary prescriptions and how people uh, adhered to them or not. And you can see major reasons for not adherence were one, already having satisfactory food habits, fine. If they have satisfactory food habits and you've evaluated that, hopefully they're going to be healthy. Unwillingness to suffer nutritional deprivation. You have to make sure your patients know that just because they go on a healthier diet does not mean they're going to become malnourished. Even if they go on more extreme plant-based diets uh, that don't involve any animal products, they're still going to be able to get all the nutrients they need. And you can advise them on supplements such as B12. Uh, difficulties to conciliate a diet with family life. And this is huge. And this is why you need to talk to your patients about it because you need to know why they are not adherent. If they're not adherent because they feel pressures from their family or they're dependent on someone else for their food and they can't make those decisions by themselves, talk to them about it because then you can make a solution with them. Maybe they're able to cook one day a week or maybe they're able to convert their family members to that healthier lifestyle as well. Taking cholesterol-lowering drugs, as I said earlier, just because you're taking a cholesterol-lowering drug does not mean you're not going to reap the benefits of uh, exercise and a healthy diet. Finally, physicians as well as patients displayed a lack of confidence in the efficacy of lipid-lowering diets. So hopefully that part is no longer going to be true for everyone who's watching this presentation right now and later. I hope all of you guys become excellent physicians who know that lots of fruits and vegetables and good amount of physical exercise 
are super, super powerful, even more powerful than a lot of medications uh, in terms of lowering lipids and improving your uh, outcomes for cardiovascular disease. Okay, so this is the last bit of the presentation. This is from the uh, American Medical Association. And it's talking, it's a, a little, it's a case between a patient and a doctor and how they counsel them. So I'm going to read a little bits of it and please feel free to read along. So uh, Dr. Garrison says, Mr. Mendez, your uh, lab results indicate that you have high cholesterol based on your current state, et cetera, et cetera. This is your risk. For patients in your situation, we recommend statins. And Mr. Mendez says, I'll do whatever you say, doc. But she goes on to say, Dr. Garrison goes on to say, you should also know that the average person with your history, uh, that is the, um, the, your average the average person with your medical history and state of health, the number needed to treat is generally between 60 and 100, which means one person will benefit if 60 to 100 people are treated. That means the other 59 people are not going to benefit and up to 20% of them are going to uh, experience some sort of uh, side effects. You never know. Uh, and the Dr. Garrison explains that here. Uh, moreover, these statins can have side effects such as muscle pain, liver damage, upset stomach, et cetera, et cetera. I'm giving you this information so that you can weigh the risks and benefits and make an informed decision. So Mr. Mendez is like, what? I feel fine. He heard the statistics and he says he does not want to start statin therapy. He decides to go down the lifestyle medicine route and starts to exercise, et cetera. So Dr. Garrison is talking to Dr. Baha and says, yo, uh, my patients are doing lifestyle modifications and they're not really taking statins and it's working out well for them. Dr. Baha says, oh, that's remarkable. Dr. Garrison goes on to say, patients, uh, I've found that providing the patients with the statistics and with the information such as the number needed to treat encourages them to think about the benefits. If, if I tell you, you're going to take the statin because there's a one in a hundred chance or one in 60 chance that it's going to help you, but there's one in five chance that you might get some sort of side effect. A lot of patients are going to start thinking about that. Dr. Paha says, really? Well, you know, our patients aren't statisticians. They're not trained to interpret this data. That's our job, not theirs. And what Dr. Garrison says is pretty insightful. It's our job as physicians to provide this information in a digestible way to our patients so that our patients can make informed decisions regarding their health care. So that's why it's important. That's why I'm giving you guys all of this data, all of these papers, so that if a patient asks like, hey doc, what is the best diet? Like I want to be on a better diet or I don't want to take these medications because I know about the side effects. You now have that data. You now have that power to say, well, there are no known risks to improving your diet in X, Y, and Z way, improving your fruit and vegetable intake, no known risks uh, to improving your physical activity, uh, increasing your physical activity over the course of a week. And you have all the research to back that up. You should also have the research to back up what the current medications are, like statins, like the cholesterol uptake inhibitors, like the uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. You should, you should know about those as well and know about what the risks are. Because there, are, there will be some patients that will benefit a lot from taking those medications. These medications are all miracle drugs. Like if you had, if you had told those people in Norway that we'd had those medications right now, it would have blown their mind. There are some patients who will benefit a lot from that, but pretty much all patients pretty much all patients will benefit from lifestyle, diet, and exercise, and a lot of times even more than the pharmaceutical. So as a final summary, I know it's coming down to the line. I'm happy to stay afterwards to discuss if you have uh, comments or if, if you want to bounce some ideas around. Final summary, the stuff on the left side is what we spoke about last time. Four healthy lifestyle practices, high in fruits and vegetables, diet high in fruits and vegetables, physical activity at least three and a half hours per week, healthy weight, and non-smoker. The impact of this is enormous, but hardly any people follow all four. Diet is the number one risk factor. So interheart and interstroke showed that increased fruit and vegetable intake and increased physical activity decrease your odds of both AMI and stroke. Now for that little review slash sneak peek, ApoB is on the distribution pathway of cholesterol, chylomicrons, VLDL, IDL, LDL. APOA is on the HDL, which is the scavenger pathway. So that's why the APOB to APOA ratio uh, is useful. In terms of pharmaceuticals, their efficacy in terms of statins and uh, ARBs, aspirin, ACE inhibitors, CCBs, et cetera, about 10 to 25, or not aspirin, sorry, uh, ARBs, uh, CCBs, um, and uh, ACE inhibitors, about 10 to 25%. Whereas as we see on this side, you can have a much greater reduction, 78% 
by these lifestyle practices. Exercise rehab could be better than PCI. Courage trial looked at PCI. Uh, polyunsaturated fats are better than monounsaturated, better than saturated fats. ASCVD begins in childhood and could begin as a fetus as well. So if you're planning on having kids, make sure you check your heart health. Don't need too much cholesterol. And make sure you talk to every single patient about their lifestyle because the impact that you can have is immense. I know I keep saying the word immense, but the impact you can have is immense. Never, ever forget the amount of power you have, even when you're a medical student, of talking to a patient about their lifestyle because their non-adherence could be totally unfounded. And if you open their mind to something like that, you could truly change their life. And that's it for me. Uh, feel free to stay on. We can chat. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can also email me. Uh, and I will make these slides available and I'll make the slides from the previous presentation available as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. That was uh, pretty eye-opening. Really down to the <laughs> one hour line. <laughs> it turned out perfect. And you packed so much really important information in there. I love the way you summarized it in the end too, where you're like, yeah, I just brain dumped so much data and so many studies on you, but here's why, like you can now take this and use it, which I thought was perfect. Yeah. If, something, if, oh, go yeah, ahead. Go for it. No, no, yeah. go for it. Go for it. Um, something I'm curious about is, um, you know, the American Heart Association reevaluated their, their um, state on cholesterol and food, consuming foods that are high in cholesterol and its impact on heart health. Um, and I'm curious when you were doing your research, if you saw, because obviously when you look at these huge epidemiological studies, you know, you get such, and, and, and the meta-analyses of, you know, 20 to 30 to 50 studies, it's like, okay, this is really robust data. Um, but, but I'm curious if you saw any sort of um, tending towards fat not being the enemy, because um, you did highlight a lot of the studies that showed that it was more of like red meat fat reduction, increased fruit and vegetable intake. Yeah. So in general, there are studies that show that uh, vegetable oils compared to uh, oils from animal sources are much better for you. And so the I don't think fat is the enemy. Again, like things like polyunsaturated fats, much better than monounsaturated, much better than saturated fats. Uh, like saturated fats are not good for you, but polyunsaturated fats, they're not bad for you. And there, there are a lot of benefits. For example, you need fats in your diet in order to uptake vitamins D, E, A, and K, right? And especially when those vitamins are so necessary for like us living, it's necessary that we have those fats in our diet and we like mix it in with our food so that we absorb those vitamins. I think the issue is the, where we're starting from is such a high consumption of fat. And so anything we can do to reduce that right now uh, is I think in the right direction. It's kind of the same thing that happened with salt a couple of years back where it's like the consumption of salt is just so high, which is why in the DASH diet and in a lot of diets, they say reduce the amount of salt. It doesn't matter what, just reduce the amount of salt because there's hidden salt in everything. Like one Chipotle burrito has, I think, twice the daily upper limit of salt required. It's like 1600 is the daily upper limit or daily recommended and 3200 is in one Chipotle burrito. It blows my mind every time that I, <laughs> I still eat Chipotle burritos sometimes. Um, but I think, I think that's kind of the deal with fat right now. And uh, in general, I think the... I don't, I don't think the jury is out anymore on cholesterol consumption because we can produce our own cholesterol, but with fat in general, we do need to consume fat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I think the question with cholesterol is, uh, cause there have been some studies showing that increase in dietary cholesterol doesn't actually have that much of an impact on blood cholesterol. Hmm. And so that's the big question of what's the conversion. Hmm. <sighs> That's, that's a good question. I'm wondering if increase in dietary cholesterol might increase your transient level of like your chylomicrons and then your VLDLs and such. But I wonder what the association is with your stored uh, like cholesterol and fatty acids, like your cholesterol esters in your peripheral tissues. Because if you, if you do increase the amount of cholesterol you're intaking, your body's going to either store it or it's going to have to get rid of it. And I feel like it's probably one of those things where your body can only get rid of so much at a time. Like your poops start floating and you're just like pooping out bile, like all the time. It's only so much your body can do, I think. Yeah. I, um, I, something that as a dietitian I encountered a lot was 
it felt like when people cleaned up their diet wholly, and it wasn't necessarily um, limiting or uh, trying to silo their preference for certain food groups, it was, it was more of a cleaning up. And when they balanced things, it was like, I don't just eat meat and potatoes and specifically red meat and potatoes. Um, it was, it was a balancing of things. Then they seemed to come into homeostasis and then, I mean, their blood levels, it was incredible, the lowering in lipid. Um, but, but it, it was less about focusing on like limiting certain things, but again, like it's, it's so conflicting. It, this, this is the most challenging part of being a dietitian is people would come in and say, well, I don't feel good when I do these things and I feel better when I do these things. And now we have all sorts of functional dietitians who say for women, it's actually really important to eat red meat. And there's this whole swing in the opposite direction where for um, specifically for women's thyroid hormone levels, um, they're saying that red meat is important, but it's like, is that because you're talking to a bunch of women who were vegan for 30 years and weren't properly nourishing and supporting their um, hormone health. And now all of a sudden they do need these. So they were depleted and now they're needing to replete in a very big way. So I have so many questions about that. <laughs> that's, that, that's super interesting because I've, I've only really ever, I guess, had the privilege of looking at it from a scientific standpoint. Yeah. And I think like, especially with like my interest being on the more epidemiological side of it, it's kind of just look at the numbers and see what it says. And I think we run into this issue where the guidelines, the, so we're, we're never going to know perfectly like how human biology works. And I think one thing that's incredible is how much leeway we have in terms of what we can do to our body and what <laughs> our body will bounce back from. And I think cholesterol is like in some part where, where it's like, even you can eat a lot of red meat and your cholesterol can still be okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean we should recommend that people should eat red meat though, right? Yeah. And I think that's where we kind of get this discrepancy where you have the uh, epidemiologists and people who solely look at the numbers who say, there's no reason for us to be eating cholesterol or there's no reason for us to be eating like saturated fats. And then there are people who are more boots on the ground, like physicians who say, I have patients who like they didn't even decrease their cholesterol intake. All they did was increase their dark green leafy vegetables and they're doing so much better, mm -hmm. right? At the end of the day, it's like a person to person thing. And I think even small changes can have such huge impacts. So oh, absolutely. got to stay with the times and see what the research is saying and kind of go with it. <laughs> Georgie, is there something from like for naturopathic physicians, do you, does the community as a whole recommend a certain way of eating or does it seem to just like we're discussing now, like be pretty individualized based on practitioner experience. Um, I mean, for like cardiovascular dis <clears throat> disease, it it's really like centered on like either the DASH diet or like um, the Mediterranean diet, the ones that have like the most, like, you know, basically the recommendations that you're talking about. Um, so yeah, that's in terms of like dietary plans. Um, or more like a lifestyle because diet makes it seem like it's something you have to follow, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's what we tend to stick to. But mind you, we're also getting roped into the idea of like having to like lower their numbers really quickly. And like we end up focusing on labs.